Hi guys, uh, welcome back. Um, I'm having a little bit of issue with my video again this morning, so I'll just go ahead and make this as an audio. So when I began this process of posting on YouTube and decided to kind of come out about my story and talk more openly about it, and again, I'm you know, working on a website and a blog that, and a book that should all be coming out in May. When I decided to do this, I thought, I, I kind of made a promise to myself that anybody that commented, you know, I wanted to make sure that I re did my best to respond to anybody that had a question that I made, my, I wanted to kind of commit to trying to try my best to answer that question or point them in the right direction. And um, there's a way that you can obviously comment down below. And I think that's mostly public. And so I've also encouraged people that if they don't want to post their question publicly or their comment publicly, they are welcome to um, follow me on Instagram at the same name, Jennifer Swan PhD. And there's an ability on there to be able to message me privately uh, if you don't want your name to show up publicly. There may be a way to do that on YouTube. I, I just am not tech savvy enough to know that. So, um, But this was a comment that came in through my Instagram and I decided I really wanted to respond to it. Um, because, you know, along the way, and again, I'm not saying this is a negative comment that I'm responding to. I'm not reading it necessarily that way. But I also want to respond to that. You know, this isn't just about, you know, rainbows and puppy dogs, right? Like if people don't agree with what I'm saying or, you know, they, they think, well, you know, I have a different opinion, I want to hear that. You know, I welcome discourse. And so, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on this. I'm just, an, I'm just you know, kind of giving my own perspective and my own process um, again, not as a clinician, just as a person going through this, but certainly my experience does not mean it's universal or that it's the way that it's going to be for your loved one or for yourself. So I'm happy to engage in any kind of discourse or if there's something I'm saying you disagree with, let's talk about it. So this comment came in on my Instagram and I don't have it in front of me to read it verbatim, but in essence, it, 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 it was referring to Dr. Jordan Peterson who, if you don't know who Dr. Jordan Peterson is, he's a clinical psychologist. He's a best-selling author. He's a worldwide speaker. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. And he um, also went through a really hellish um, benzo withdrawal experience. And I'll get into a little bit of his story later, but I'll also make some links down below. So if you're interested, you can listen to his story. But the commenter said something like, you know, here's Dr. Peterson, you know, clinical psychologist, has his PhD, he's a professor. Um, been in the field, you know, all of his life, and how does he not know? How does he get stuck on a benzodiazepine? How does this happen? And here you are with your PhD, 25 years in the field, has been a professor, been in private practice, worked in psychiatric hospitals. How did this happen to you? And, um, you know, I want to respond to this because, I, believe me, um, this is a question I've asked myself <laughs> Um, a thousand times over the last couple of years, like how did I not know? How did, how did I, how did I let this happen? Um, and I've kind of gotten to a place where I've let myself off the hook. Or I shouldn't say I've let myself off the. I've worked my way off the hook, um, and began to just kind of focus on okay, well, once you know better, you do better. And that was really the impetus for my saying, okay, I know better now. I know something about this. I know something about benzodiazepines now that I did not know before. Should I have known before? Maybe, probably. I didn't. Um, should Dr. Peterson have known before? I don't know. I, I don't know what he thinks about this. I don't know Dr. Peterson, Peterson personally. I don't know if this is something he's beat himself up over either. Uh, I know I sure did. But again, I'm going with the process of as I know better, I do better. And my doing better is going to be not just better self-care, but putting out these YouTube videos writing about it, talking about it, trying to help people. And not because I think these are terrible medications um, or we've got to protect ourselves from bad medicine or things like that. It's really about informed consent. That's what it comes down to for me is that we all have the right information. But then that begs a larger question, right? Which is who do we expect to give us all that data? Um, doctors, pharmacists, um, ourselves, I would say prior to my getting sick, um, I probably more heavily relied on the doctors and the pharmacists to guide me in the right direction and make sure that I was aware that, yeah, take this med, it should help. Um, but look, you got to know that there are some risks. Now, are there risks with any medicine? For sure. Um, are there higher risks with certain medications? Absolutely. Um, so 
so I, I've definitely changed my tune in terms of I definitely think we need to be better advocates for ourselves. I think we need to be, you know, we have access to looking up black box warnings, you know, which are the warnings that the FDA puts out about medications. Um, and, and I can't, I, I think knowing a lot of doctors and having doctors as friends and, I, and actually working with a lot of doctors in my practice, I saw what they were up against kind of being doctors in our current medical system with the sheer numbers of patients that they actually had to see if they worked for particular medical groups or hospitals. And it was insanity, honestly. And so I'm sure there's not, it's not really practical, right? It, it might be what we want to have happen that our doctors sit down and spend 10 minutes with us saying, I'd like you to take this antibiotic or this benzo or this other med and here's the black box warnings. We would love that. I don't think it's practical. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the pharmacist, maybe there's a better chance of that happening there. We can certainly work to inform ourselves as well. And if we have elderly people or disabled people in our lives that are not able to do that, we have to do that for them, be advocates for our loved ones. Because when you're sick, the last thing you really want to do is be doing research if you could put this pill in your body. But I want to go back to something really fast for me that happened that I said in another post, and it's really important, right? So who are we trusting to give us the data, okay? So I, I don't blame the doctors. I don't even blame the pharmacists. I, I, I don't blame myself anymore either. But, but I don't blame the doctors in the sense that, again, practically speaking, I don't know that they actually just have the time to sit down and go over every single warning of these meds. Some of that has to be on us. But I do have a problem with this, and I said this in one of my last posts. My entire experience with benzodiazepines began um, because I had had a, a, a neurotoxic reaction to the antibiotic, the generic version of Leviquin. Um, I was given, I had gone to an urgent care, I was given this antibiotic for bronchitis, or so they thought it was bronchitis, and within two days, my nervous system blew up. Um, and. I was a disaster, and then they ended up putting me on a benzodiazepine in an attempt to try to calm my nervous system down. Whether it helped or not, I don't know, um, but ultimately, um, now I'm struggling with benzodiazepines. Um, the reason I bring the, the antibiotic back up, though, is because of this. My injury happened to that medication in September of 2016. The FDA... Um, had put out many, many warnings about this particular class of drugs. And I really want you to pay attention to this because if you haven't heard of Levaquin, Cipro is another one of these meds that's in this class of, medi class of meds. And it's commonly prescribed. So in 2008, this class, of this class of medication, these fluoroquinolone antibiotics, Levaquin, Cipro, and others, uh, we're told there's an FDA warning they can cause spontaneous tendon ruptures. In 2013, they amended it to add in it can cause potentially permanent peripheral neuropathy, nerve damage, and pain. In 2015, a federal uh, the FDA advisory committee met to discuss specifically bronchitis, sinusitis, and, and UTIs, urinary tract infections. And they deemed in that 2015 meeting that the, the risks outweighed the benefits using this class of medications for UTIs, bronchitis, and sinusitis. Okay, I was put on this medication for bronchitis a year later. In 2016, just six months before I was put on the medication, they amended it and added another black box warning to it saying this, this could cause potentially debilitating and or irreversible damage to the central nervous system. Well, that's what happened to me. Okay, so I was in the unlucky pool of people that got the symptoms that warranted the black box warnings, okay? Nobody's fault, really, right? Had I had informed consent, would I have taken it? Absolutely not. But I did not do my research, and nobody gave me that informed consent or that, that, that possibility of informed consent. My issue is, however, and this is the thing that I will never really understand, is that once I got sick, once I had 40 symptoms of central nervous system damage, not one doctor that I know said, this is what happened to you. There's, there's black box warnings specifically about the, the exact things that you're going through, Jennifer. Not, not one of the eight specialists I saw, not one doctor that I spoke to ever said until finally months later, one ENT that I went to I think it was the second or third one I'd seen, said, oh my God, this happened to my wife. It happened to his wife, so he was aware that it could happen.
but here are, were three black box warnings and an FDA advisory council meeting saying do not give these meds for specifically the very thing it was given. And it's fine, okay? So we messed up and I got the drug. Nobody told me not to take it. I didn't do my research, but now I'm sick. And everyone is telling me, nope, you just have generalized anxiety disorder. I, we've never seen or heard anything like this in anybody. And it was all there. So believe me, this haunts me. And I talk about this a lot because it haunts me. It haunts me for me. It haunts me for, for, for my family, for, for my friends, for, the, for all of us. Why? Because this stuff is out there and I don't know why it's not getting to the doctors. I don't know why, you know, or, or where the protocol is for when you do have somebody that shows up in your office having had a side effect from a med or an adverse reaction to a med, especially one that's been documented, um, that you're gaslit, you know, and told, no, you have an anxiety condition. Um, so my point in bringing that back up is, it still then becomes incumbent upon us, right, to to check this out. And so should I have known better um, about the benzodiazepines? Let's move on to that. Yeah, I, I actually think I should have. Um, I, these, are, these are commonly prescribed medications. Um, there's a black box warning on them that they're not supposed to be combined with op- opioids. I think most Many people know that, although they're still commonly prescribed with opioids. Um, And then in 2020, there was a black box amendment that added in um, the very high potential for uh, developing uh, psychological and physical dependence to these meds quickly um, and the possibility for very challenging withdrawal effects. So here again are these black box warnings, and yet it's really undermined about that, that this that you know a bad withdrawal can really happen or this can really occur um, and so uh, you know yes should I have known better I would like to think that and again I'll, I'll do my best now to not make the same mistake with anybody that I'm working with or anybody that I know um, and again it's not bad meds bad bad doctors bad pharmacists it's simply our medical system quite honestly in my opinion is not set up to slow down to the speed of wisdom that we need it to operate at so that we don't create these type of medication injuries. It's just not set up that way. So it does make it incumbent upon us to do our homework and our research and to slow things down. Um, it, but the other piece I wanna bring up about um, knowing kind of you know what the effects are, I really wanna point you guys, if you haven't seen Dope Sick on Hulu, check it out. It's not about benzos, but it is about the opioid crisis, it's about Oxycontin, it's about pharmaceutical advertising, it's about how great the pharmaceutical advertising was for for Oxycontin, that it had doctors and pharmacists alike swimming in the Kool-Aid and having no real idea the damage that was being done. Um, I think this is also true with a lot of other medications, and I'll speak specifically to the one I'm on, uh, Xanax, I'm on Xanax, and uh, it was originally designed by uh, the pharmaceutical uh, company Upjohn. And in 1993, um, Upjohn funded a study uh, with two doctors, uh, Isaac Marks and Richard Swinson. They wanted to see you know, how their drug fared with panic disorder. And again, this is 1993. It was published in the Br- British Journal of Psychiatry, the full study. I think it started with like 154 people, ended with like 75, which is pretty typical, I think, in terms of the beginning numbers and ending numbers. But again, people were put on, some people were put on Xanax for panic, and some people were given a placebo, okay? And the people that were given the Xanax improved by week two. Their panic symptoms were improved by week two. By week four, it had plateaued, and there was no further improvement. Week six to eight, no further improvement. Beyond week eight, they began to get worse. At week 23, so how, how the study worked was week zero to eight, they were in the treatment, they were getting the placebo or the Xanax. Week eight to 16, they were tapering them off the Xanax or the placebo. Week 16 to 43, they were just following them for symptoms, okay? Um, at week 23, the people that had taken the Xanax versus the placebo were much worse than they were before they began. Okay, this was known in 1993, but it was still pushed as a, a wonder drug for panic 
and anxiety. And now it's being prescribed. You know, Geraldine Burns talks about, you know, when she went to the Massachusetts legislature pushing for, um, you know, informed consent and those types of things, she had people make a list of why they had been put on their benzo. This list was, you know, two to three pages long, maybe even longer. All the reasons why, you know, anxiety, panic, dry eye, stomach problems, perimenopause, headaches, you name it. Anxiety and panic didn't even make the first page, okay? Uh, these meds are being used as, as, as front lines for perimenopausal women. Uh, I have friends that were put on them for gastrointestinal problems. I have two friends that were put on it because they had a bad reaction to a steroid injection. I have one person that was, I was put on it because I had a bad reaction to an antibiotic. Uh, I have another person who was put on it for headaches. Many people are put on it for insomnia. One person for dry eye. I mean, we can go down the list. So again, you know, it's up to us to pay attention to this. But here's this study. It's known in 1993, 29 years ago, that the people that took the Xanax got worse. They were worse than the people that got the sugar pill. Okay? They got worse as a result of this. And so why do we not know that? Why do our doctors not know that? Well, I'd like to think that doctors have time to read every single journal article that's out there. But that's not true. They don't, they don't have that time. Our medical system is not set up to give them that kind of time. Um, we're not obviously going to be, we're not even privy to these journal articles, right? You have, to be, you have to subscribe to these. You have to be part of some sort of academic institution to even get these journal articles to read. So we're not going to be able to see this. So who's, who's educating our doctors? Who's telling them, hey, guess what? We did this study. And you know what? After two weeks, people were feeling so much better with their panic. But they're not being told... And by week 23, they're worse off than they were than before they took the med, okay? So I don't think that what we see in Dope Sick when you watch that show or read that book, I don't think that we're dealing with anything all that different when it comes to other medications as well. And so, um, again, it, 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 it puts it on us, but I think there's we all have responsibility in this. Um, you know, as it relates to Dr. Peterson, like I said, I don't know him personally. I'm, I'm so sorry for what he went through. He went through a horrific journey of this. Um, you know, he was placed on the benzo ac- actually in 2016 after a really bad reaction to something he ate. And, it, and he ended up having horrible insomnia and, and all types of issues. And he was put on a benzo and he stayed on. He was, he was a relatively low dose, he thought. He thought he was fine. He stayed on it for a couple years. Fast forward to his wife getting sick with cancer and it being very touch and go and very um, heightened anxiety. And he, um, his anxiety and depression obviously were worsening situationally. They increased the dose. He started to have a, um, a kind of a paradoxical reaction to the medication. He was feeling worse every time he took it. And um, they took him off rapidly to start him on ketamine for depression. Um, both ended up being a bad decision. He developed akathisia for him, pacing, feeling like he was being hit with a cattle prod. I won't go into all this. Long story short, he tried everything to come off this med, went to high-end treatments in the United States, treatment in Toronto, ended up having to be placed into a nine-day uh, induced coma in Russia to be taken off this med, um, and then seeking treatment in Florida and Serbia. I mean, this poor man has been all over the world. Thank God he's doing better and I hope he continues to speak out about this um, because we need more people to speak out about it. Again, not bad doctors, bad pharmacists, bad meds, simply a system that is not set up um, to really work for us in terms of understanding what we're putting in our bodies. And what I can tell you is before 2016, I was one of those people. I don't feel good, go to the doctor, what can I take? Um, I'm not one of those people anymore. Um, I can't afford to be one of those people anymore. I don't even have a system that can sustain or manage most of the meds I try to put in it. Um, but we learn, and hopefully we do better as we learn. And so I appreciate the comment. Um, how did I not know? I don't know, but I know now. And um, I pray that I can be of service to other people um, you know, proactively before they put things in their body that maybe they're not going to react or respond to very well and or that there are warnings and there are there is lots of evidence that there can be problems with certain meds. We need to be aware of this. Thanks for listening guys. I appreciate it and um, I'll be I'll do my best to, you know, answer any questions or comments as I go along. Thanks.